Okay, let's get started. First, we've got to fix these lights, and you've got to help me how to do that. Is, are you seeing this well right now? No, okay. So what do we do? Turn the light off here? Is that a good idea? Better? Okay. Now I'll have to memorize what's here because it's not intuitive. Whenever you design a user interface, it's a good idea to be intuitive, I think. I'm not sure if this is really intuitive. I've always had these problems with these user interfaces. It's okay, it's lecture and speaker. Next time we'll try that and see if we get the same configuration. If you don't get the same configuration, it's more like probabilistic, right? That's, 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 that's been one of the design principles of computers, uh, having deterministic designs. You give the same input, you get a deterministic output, same output all the time. But today, people are looking into new designs where even if you give the same input, you may get a different output. That's a more probabilistic design. Now, why could this be desirable? Or it's also called approximate computation, potentially. Why could this be desirable? Can you think of ways where you could take advantage of this or any benefit to something like this? Any thoughts? Basically, you give an input to the computer, the response you get is a little bit different every time. Sometimes it may be the same, yes. It could be much faster, exactly. Maybe by reducing, for example, the accuracy of computation, the computer can operate much faster. Because, I don't know, you can reduce the delay in the ALU such that not the critical path, when you exercise the critical path, you get the wrong result. But maybe slightly wrong result. Which may not be that bad if your algorithm at the high level can tolerate it, right? If, for example, you have massive amounts of data and most of it, 99% of it, you get it correct. And the inference you're making out of those massive amounts of data is in the end correct. Despite the little incorrect answer that you get. For example, some, if you're displaying some pixels on screen and some parts where people are not really fully focusing, maybe you can afford to be incorrect over there, right? Because people are not really focusing over there. Of course, you've got to be careful here, right? What if the person focuses on that part of the screen where re they really need that detail? But yes, that's exactly one reason why you may want a computer to be not perfectly correct, but approximate. Speed, energy could be another reason, because if you want to make a, per a computer perfectly correct, you may need to expend a lot of energy. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, for, refresh is one example. Remember the mysteries that we've discussed uh, earlier uh, uh, in, uh, in the first or second lecture? One of the issues was the refresh. You need to refresh the RAM such that you keep the data inside the memory. And that consumes a lot of energy. And I asked, some of you, to uh, I asked you to calculate how much energy it consumes to keep memory alive, store all of the data correctly, and it's actually on the order of kilowatts and kilowatts if you have large, large amounts of memory in a supercomputing center, for example. And I also mentioned that this thing is right now consuming energy because it's really refreshing its memory. So really the battery is draining because of the refresh. It needs to keep the data intact inside that DRAM. Now, if you can afford to be approximate, if you can say, oh, this data that I store over here, I can tolerate some, some errors in it then maybe we can say, oh, I'm not going to refresh as frequently to keep all of the data intact. I can tolerate some of the errors, even without correcting those errors. And if you know that the error can be bounded because not all of the cells will lose their data when you increase the refresh interval, and that's what we discussed also in the second lecture. Basically, uh, there's this distribution in memory where some cells are very leaky but some other memory cells are very strong. So most cells can keep their data for a long time. So even if you increase the refresh interval, even if you reduce how often you refresh your memory, you may not lose a lot of data. Maybe you'll lose 10 bits out of 32 gigabytes. Now, if you can afford to lose that, that's probably a good idea to be approximate because you're 
basically reducing your energy consumption significantly by, let's say, doubling your refresh interval or quadrupling your refresh interval, basically cutting your refresh energy by half or 75% or 87.5% as you double. Right? Of course, you run into the problem of diminishing returns. As you double the refresh interval, you reduce the refresh energy by half and half and half and half every time. And that's the rule of diminishing returns. At some point, it doesn't make sense to reduce the refresh interval by half anymore because you're not refreshing often anyways. Right? So that's another example. You save energy by being approximate. The, always the question is, can you actually tolerate being approximate? Can you tolerate being wrong sometimes? And that's the danger. Because if you expose this approximation, uh, if you expose imprecise results to the user, if they can tolerate it, that's good. But if they cannot tolerate it, that's bad. So you've got to be very careful in judging that. And if you actually misjudge that, you can cause security problems also, as we've discussed also in the second lecture. Right? That was not intentional in that case. The Rohammer problem is not an intentional problem. It's actually, it was just not anticipated. It just happened that this hardware error, when you access memory over and over, you get an error, bit flip, in adjacent locations that just slipped into the field. But if you're, do, if you're being approximate in your results, you may cause similar effects, right? In an unintended fashion. It may so happen that you're being approximate in certain locations by reducing your refresh rate. And as a result, someone can exploit the situation to flip those bits in those locations, maybe find those bits, and take over an entire system. OK. This was not the topic that I want to talk about, but since uh, since things evolved that way, this is an important concept, basically. The con again, the principle is, do you want a perfectly correct design, or do you want a slightly imprecise or slightly approximate design? There are benefits to both, but there are downsides to both also, again. Okay? Uh, one, one last point over here, uh, basically. Uh, in today's applications, there are a lot of applications today. I gave an example of putting something onto the screen, right? But... Uh, machine learning is another application. There's a lot of data that's being uh, brought into a machine learning engine that tries to form a model out of that data. And it, maybe it doesn't make sense to make all of that data correct because there's a lot of noise in that data anyway. So maybe you make your processor design not so correct also, but do it very fast. Then you can converge to a much faster solution in machine learning. Another example is genomics. If you want to actually process someone's genome and understand the differences of that genome from another genome, which may be the reference genome, another genome that you know of really well. Compare these two genomes so that you can find the vulnerabilities of a person to a disease, for example. Again, you may not, you may, you may not need to be perfectly correct in the processing because there's a lot of other errors that are happening. So when you sequence someone else's, someone's genome, there's, there are errors in the determination of that genome that's caused by the chemical process uh, due to the genome sequence analysis machine itself. So you need to have a higher level algorithm that tolerates those errors. So you, uh, you, you never look at a single sequence genome. You normally look at multiple, you sequence multiple times a person's genome, and you try to find a confidence level. Oh, this is this person's genome with 99% confidence, because I've sequenced that genome ten, like some, some number of times, 100 times, and then did that comparison. So there's a level that corrects these errors in the algorithm, at the algorithm level, because you process a person's genome many, many times, and then you can tolerate those errors. So why not tolerate the errors that are happening due to the hardware design in the processor, right? You can consider that just another source of error, and as long as your algorithm at the high level can tolerate those errors and still bring you a good confidence level, maybe that's okay because now you design a much faster, much more energy efficient processor and you get to your final end goal, the problem you're solving, potentially much faster. So this is the kind of thinking uh, I believe would be very impactful going into the future because we're not really designing processors just to design processors. Right? That's not the goal in the end. Remember the stack, computing stack, beginning from the electrons all the way to problems? The goal of computing, if you remember the slide that I put up early on, according to Richard Hamming, is to generate insight. How do you generate insight? By solving problems. The goal is really to solve problems. And if you want to solve the problem within a given time bound, maybe you design the processor toward that goal, not necessarily 
toward the goal of just being perfectly correct all the time. So that's another principle, basically, which we have not really explicitly talked about. You always design the processor toward some design point, which is really a goal that you have in solving some problems. So one design point could be, which, which has been the in, design point of general purpose processing for a long time, uh, that we would like to design a processor that can do everything. It's not fastest than everything, but it's not the slowest in everything, but its average performance is really good at everything. And that has been the design point that's been very successful for companies like Intel and AMD. Well, maybe not so much for AMD these days, but <laughs> Intel for sure, uh, for a very long time, right? They've designed processors to design general purpose applications, all kinds of applications, reasonably well. And that's what we do on, this, on these devices. But going forward, maybe that's not what's going to happen as much. That's why you see these different types of processors creeping into the field. Google's uh, tensor processing unit is one example. GPUs are another example. If I can stop diverging from uh, the topic, we'll talk about GPUs a little bit also. <laughs> so maybe I should stop here, but uh, keep these principles in mind. In the end, those are the things that, that matter the most at the end of this class. Okay. Any questions on this? Burning questions? Good. I assume everything is very clear. <laughs> so let's go into dependence handling. Uh, and you can keep this in mind also. Do we need to handle dependencies always perfectly? And we may discuss that later on. Uh, a, a while back, I think it's been two weeks, hopefully you guys had a good, uh, you guys and girls, when I say guys, it's both, always, <laughs> uh, had a good break uh, uh, during uh, this is Easter break, right? It's a long Easter break. And hopefully you remember where we left off. We left off at pipelining. We covered pipelining. Uh, we're going to start an issuance in pipelining, and I'm not sure if we're going to go in this order. I may actually do out-of-order execution, which is a really good example of dynamic scheduling. Basically, we'll dynamically schedule the uh, future lectures. Uh, but basically, we're going to cover some issues in pipelining today. And this could be really de uh, in-depth. We could actually spend four or five lectures on these issues, but clearly we're not going to have be afford that in this class. But in my uh, next class, in the next computer architecture class, if you're interested in this, we will go into a lot of these topics in more detail. Okay, but before that, if you're interested, uh, I'll do a lecture announcement for my own lecture. This is a lecture that every professor who starts at ETH delivers. It's called an inaugural lecture. Uh, and mine will happen on May 15, 2015, and you guys are all invited. Actually, everybody, in, uh, it's, it's a public lecture, everybody's invited, but you guys are specially invited since you're here. Uh, you can come and hear me talk about future computing architectures. It might be interesting, depending on your interest level. Uh, it's not required, but it should be fun, hopefully. I think it's from 5.15 to 6.15. Uh, uh, this building uh, in the auditorium maximum. Any questions? Say it again. Time machine. What do you mean? <laughs> Oh, wow, yeah, that's yeah, excellent, wow. But, you know, this is good. This is, this is an example of approximate computing. <laughs> an approximate uh, typing over there, which is clearly prone to errors in my mind. I don't know why I was thinking 2015 over there. And I, ha I actually don't know. <laughs> I'll have to figure out. So that's, that's another thing. How do, you, how do you figure out what has gone on in the brain to, fig, uh, to actually write that 5 over there versus 7, right? I wonder if we'll, we're, we're ever going to be able to answer that question. But I'm pretty sure that if we're going to answer that question, that's really the secret of the answer that, to that question is in computing. There are, there are people out there uh, who are trying to model the brain and figure out these processes. It's nowhere near figuring out why I have put down 5 over there instead of 7. But... People are striving. So building models of the brain uh, and building specialized compute engines to actually enable those models of the brain is a really interesting area also. So I guess I'm jumping, but thank you for correcting me. So now you don't need a time machine, hopefully, <laughs> which means that hopefully a lot of you will come. So it should be fun. I, I don't know what I'll talk about yet, but <laughs> it, it will definitely be related to future computing architectures. <laughs> It could be some of what we've 
touched upon uh, today, like brain or security or some other things. Okay, so let's do a very quick review of pipelining because we're going to go a little bit deeper into pipelining and talk about some of the design issues. So this was the, one of the first pictures that I put up uh, when we talked about pipelining. This is a multi-cycle machine. And pipelining enables you to pipeline different parts uh, of the data uh, operation of different instructions. That's essentially it, right? So you can have four cycles per four instructions instead of four cycles per instruction, right? Of course, I asked the question, is life always this beautiful? And so it's always a good idea to ask that question because once you ask that question, you figure out the problems and you find the solutions and you generate the next Google or Facebook or whatever of the world. So hopefully you'll generate something even more powerful than that. Uh, powerful in terms of the benefit that provide to the human society. Uh, okay, so uh, clearly this is not an ideal pipeline. It's not always this beautiful because, remember, we discussed the ideal pipeline. You want identical operations, but we don't get that. We have different instructions, which lead to external fragmentation. I'm going to go through this really fast just to jog your memories. We don't even have uniform sub-operations because different pipeline stages take different time. As a result, you have internal fragmentation. Some part of the clock cycle is wasted because you're really dependent on this clock. And some of you asked uh, after lecture, I don't think I covered this during lecture, but can you, make, can you get rid of the clock? Right? And that's a good idea sometimes. The, if the question is, can you make it work? Right? If you get rid of the clock, you need to ensure that the, uh, the operations happen asynchronously, are synchronized properly when they need each other's results, and that synchronization usually leads to some overhead. So there's a whole area of computing called asynchronous computing, basically clockless computing, that gets rid of the clock overhead. But we're not going to cover those architectures uh, in this lecture, although that's definitely a good area to think about. Uh, the, uh, the downside has, uh, whenever you try to uh, design a very complex asynchronous machine, the downside has always been the complexity of the design. You need to make sure that these different components that are talking to each other are operating correctly. Okay. Uh, so you could potentially get rid of this with asynchrony, but that's a very difficult task. So independent operations, the third thing is basically instructions are unfortunately dependent to each, uh, on each other sometimes, not always. So you need to somehow make sure the pipeline works at high performance, even in the presence of these dependencies. And the, this lecture is dedicated to this part, basically. And we've discussed the other parts briefly uh, last time. So pipeline stalls. When pipeline is not always moving because sometimes there are dependencies, and how do we make the pipeline moving? So issues in pipeline design target all of these, uh, balancing work in pipeline stages, uh, keeping the pipeline correct, moving and full in the presence of events that disrupt the pipeline flow, basically handling dependence in terms of data and control, and handling resource contention. And long latency multi-cycle operations are a special case of dependencies, basically, because there's usually an instruction that depends on this long latency memory operation, and how do you actually make the pipeline move in the presence of this long latency operation? And that's, this, this has actually been the most difficult part of designing microprocessors for, for espe especially in the last two decades, because memory latencies have increased significantly on the order of hundreds and hundreds of clock cycles. And how do you actually design a pipeline that actually keeps doing useful work in the presence of a load instruction that you're waiting for, for let's say 1,000 uh, clock cycles. So we'll cover that. Uh, out of order execution is one example of uh, tolerating that latency. So handling exceptions and interrupts, we hopefully might get to that. I'm not sure yet, but uh, we discussed that. Basically, minimizing stalls. So cause, what are the causes of pipeline stalls? If you want to remove something, you need to understand what that is. Basically, stall is a condition when the pipeline stops moving. And it's caused by three things. Potentially resource contention, dependencies, and long latency operations. Okay, dependencies, as I mentioned, it's also called dependencies, and you'll see this uh, uh, in, if you take a compiler's course, for example, probably you'll hear dependency. Sometimes it's called a hazard, but as I mentioned, hazard, it's only a hazard if you don't handle it correctly. Uh, and they dictate ordering requirements between instructions. And there are two types, data and control dependencies. Resource contention, as I mentioned, again, is sometimes called resource dependence. It's really dependence on a resource, but it's better to think of it as contention because you're really trying to uh, access the resource. Okay, but this is not really fundamental to the program semantics. Uh, actually, we'll talk about program semantics and what's fundamental to it in a little bit. But resources are dictated by the hardware. So if you had infinite resources, you will never have resource contention, right? Right. 
Okay, so let's look at this resource contention in a little bit more detail. This was the last slide that we had uh, two weeks ago. Uh, this happens when instructions in two pipeline stages, oh, this is not nice, okay, uh, need the same resource. So there are two solutions to it. You eliminate the resource uh, cause of the contention, duplicate the resource, or increase its throughput somehow. Remember, we did it with the washing machine, right? We duplicated the washing machine. Uh, Okay, there are multiple ways of doing that. Or you detect the resource contention and stall one of the contending stages. So if you have only one memory, uh, you, can have, uh, you need to have, have an instruction to access the memory and a data access the memory. If you have a load instruction that's trying to access memory, and if you have a fetch operation in the instruction fetch stage in the pipeline, uh, this load needs the memory and this fetch needs the memory, but you have only one port to memory, or one memory and one port. One, basically, one way to access memory. That's... First of all, that's a bad design. If you have a pipeline machine, and if, you, if, you, if, if two parts, uh, two stages in your pipeline really depend on a single resource, you'd better duplicate that resource or enable both stages to progress. Because loads are very common, and also fetches. Fetch is something you need to do every cycle, right? ideally. You don't want that to be delayed. But in this case, let's assume that this, uh, somebody designed this bad machine. Uh, you can detect this contention. There's a load that's trying to access memory, and there's a fetch state that's trying to access memory. Who do you prioritize? Well, if you want to keep the pipeline moving, you'd better stall the fetch, fetch stage because the load needs to go out of the machine, right? You've already fetched it. It's trying to access memory. So basically prioritize a later pipeline stage such that the f earlier pipeline stage, like the fetch stage, can move later. Okay. Well, register file has the same issue, actually. But again, it's a bad idea in general to have a pipeline stage stalled because of a resource contention, especially if that resource is needed always. Right? Fetch stage always needs a data port uh, to instruction memory. Okay, so that's what, there's one example of resource dependence. Uh, I'm going to uh, cover this, and we're going to use this sort of figure uh, uh, throughout this course, uh, through, throughout this lecture. Basically, what's happening here is uh, you have this add instruction, and you have and or and sub-instructions that are dependent on the result of the add instruction. So add instruction writes to the register file over here, and and instruction needs to read the register file uh, over here, right? Uh, basically, we're, we're going to assume that the register file can be read and written in the same cycle. Well, how do you do that? One way of doing that is you can ensure that the write, this write over here, takes place during the first half of the cycle, and the read takes place during the second half of the cycle. There's no problem. Except this guy, one of these guys need a time machine, for example, in this case, right? Because this guy is writing, this ad is writing to the register file at cycle five. Remember, this is pipelines. And this and is reading from the register file at cycle three. So clearly, there's a data dependency here. And this is not a correct execution order, as you can see. So you really need to somehow delay this end until the result is available. But we will see how we ensure that this is a correct execution order, but not through the register file. If you look here, add actually produces its result on cycle three, and end actually needs that result really in cycle four, right? Because end happens in this ALU, and add finishes in this ALU. So if you can supply this result directly by forwarding it to the end, this end, this can be a correct execution order. Okay. But this is an example of resource contention. Let's uh, pull back a little bit. Basically, we're going to assume that write takes place during the first half of the cycle and read takes place during the second half of the cycle. Okay. So if you have this kind of design, the problem is uh, now uh, operations that involve register file have only half a clock cycle to complete the operation. People have done this sort of designs. Uh, that's okay. When we talk about memories, we can go into more of that. Okay, this is an example of resource dependence, basically. You need to ensure that uh, the, write, uh, the stage that writes and the stage that reads don't conflict with each other. And one way of handling it is this way. Right? You can be more creative, have two ports. Right? Okay, so let's talk about data dependencies. Basically, there are three types of data dependencies, only one of which is really real. And the real one is really the flow dependence. It's basically a true data dependence. You have an instruction that needs a result after some other instruction writes that result. That's why it's called read after write. There are also two other dependencies that you need to be careful about in a pipeline machine so that you don't get the incorrect ordering 
One is the output dependence. You do a write after write. An instruction writes to a register. Another instruction writes to the same register. Now, in a sequential von Neumann machine, which is the hallmark of which is sequential execution, you'd better get the writes in the correct order, right? The one in the sequential, uh, later in the sequential program order should overwrite the other one. You, you should not get, the, get it uh, the, in the other order. Otherwise, you'll get a wrong result. Anti-dependence is kind of similar. It's exactly the opposite of the flow dependence. Basically, an instruction uh, re it reads from a register, and a later instruction writes to that register. You'd better make sure that the instruction that reads from that register doesn't get the wrong value, doesn't get the later value. Well, I'll, I'll give you examples of this. So which ones cause stalls in a pipeline machine? Actually, all of them could, potentially. You need to ensure semantics of the program is correct for all of these dependencies. This becomes uh, even more interesting when you do out-of-order execution, when you try to reorder instructions. So flow dependencies always need to be obeyed because they, are, they constitute true dependence on a value, right? Because an instruction writes, another instruction reads. Assuming that these are useful instructions, that's a real dependence, right? You're doing an add and a multiply is dependent on it. Whereas these two are not, they're really artificial, right? If you think about it, you write to a register and you write to the register again. What is, what is the meaning of this semantically? Nothing other than the fact that you don't have enough registers. Right. They exist because you don't have enough registers. If you had infinite number of registers, you would never have an output or an anti-dependence. Because whenever you create a new value, you would give it a new name. But for flow dependence, that's really semantics of the program. The program needs to have this result of the add communicate to the multiply to operate correctly. Does that make sense? This is, again, very fundamental. You can think of this as a data flow principle, right? If you think you remember the data flow graph we've discussed, instructions, you can, you can think of instructions as really uh, things that operate when their data is available. Flow dependencies are basically data flow dependencies. Output and anti-dependencies, they don't exist in a data flow machine, really. Because data flow machine doesn't really have a register file, if you will. Everything is really this graph you have different arcs communicated, communicating uh, values between instructions. OK, keep this in mind. Basically, uh, they are dependence on a name, not a value. Whereas a flow dependence, you really need the value over there. With the output and anti-dependence, uh, you don't, you write to a register, this multiply writes to a register, and later in the program, another add writes to, writes to the same register. As long as they're not related to each other in some other way, some other dependent way, there's no relationship between them. OK, let's look at these pictorially. This is a flow dependence, basically read after write. This instruction needs the value that's produced by this previous instruction. So the data needs to flow from this instruction to this instruction. This is an anti-dependence. Again, this, is, uh, this instruction is producing a result into R3. Let's say you store it to memory later on. And this instruction uh, is writing to uh, R1. But this instruction is reading from R1. This is anti-dependence. If you had infinite number of registers, this, there is no reason why this should be R1, right? Because R1's value is destroyed, basically, at this point. Output dependence, again, same thing over here. Uh, basically, here, uh, you have this R3 written by this instruction. You have this R3 written by this instruction again. Again, you're destroying the value that was produced by this instruction and putting it into R3. There's no reason why you should really put it into R3, except you may not have enough registers. So again, write after write is uh, not a true dependence, if you will. So if you think about this, you could really eliminate this dependence by moving, putting the value somewhere else. Right? And that's one of the very fundamental concepts of out-of-order execution. How do you make sure this instruction executes before this instruction for some reason? You may think of why. Let's say you have a load instruction that's producing R1 that's taking a 1,000 cycles. But the, 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 the values R6 and R7 are ready. You don't need to wait for them. So why don't you execute this instruction earlier? If you execute this instruction earlier, there's one problem. You may not want to write into R3 because R3 may be needed by some other instruction that's going to be executed later because this value is going to be produced later. So maybe you store this somewhere else. And you can store somewhere else because you, these really have nothing to do with each other. They're just dependent on a name, 
because compiler didn't have enough registers. Okay, so that's called register renaming, and we'll talk about that when we get to out of order execution. But the fundamental reason you can do that is these two things are really specifying in a name, there's no value dependence. Okay, any questions? So let's look at the pipeline operation very quickly. This is, I've shown you this before. You have a load and subtract. These go through the pipeline this way. They're independent. Everything is nice. What if the sub-instruction were dependent on load? Then you have a problem. Uh, okay, so how do you handle data dependencies? Let's, uh, I'll, I'll give you some readings first. Uh, I hope you're reading. How many of you are reading the book? Okay, excellent. Do you find it useful? Okay, excellent. I think if you do the readings early on, it might be even more useful. But I, I've also assigned this uh, paper uh, that's a little bit long, unfortunately, and that's not perfect, but it's, it's one of the best papers, in my opinion, that were written talking about these dependencies, for example, and uh, out-of-order superscalar processors. So it's already on the website. We put it on the website last week, uh, the previous week. So please take a look at that. Okay, uh, so how to handle data depends in a pipeline machine. As I mentioned, anti and output dependencies are not real, are not true. They're easier to handle in a pipeline machine. Basically, you write to the destination register in one stage and in program order at the end of the pipeline, basically. If you do that, and if you maintain this invariant, you don't have a problem. Okay? Flow dependencies are more interesting because they really cause your stalls. I mean, these could cause stalls also, depending on what you do, and we'll talk about that. But uh, as long as you eliminate those stalls, they're easy to eliminate. But these are hard to eliminate. Right? They're, they're there for a reason. Uh, and there are five fundamental ways of handling these. <laughs> Let's see how many, of you, how many of these you can name. I'll give some of them. One very primitive way is to detect the dependence and wait until the value is available in the register file. So there's two portions of it, detecting the dependence and waiting. Right. Now this may not be the high performance way because if we go back over here uh, to this little picture that we had, yes, this incorrect picture, basically this add writes to the, writes its results as, uh, to S0 in the register file in cycle five. Now this and, when you actually uh, try to read the register file, you need to somehow detect that the data is not there because there's some previous instruction that's writing into the register file and it has not written yet. So you need to wait until cycle five. This, this instruction needs to be stopped. And it needs to wait until cycle five when the value is really available in the register file. Sounds like a bad idea, right? Why a bad idea? Because we know that the value was produced over here, right? The add, added S2 and S3N produced the result over here when this instruction, even before this instruction, needs that result. So the second is really detecting. You have to detect this situation, and you have to do something about it. That something could be waiting, bad idea. That something could be forwarding the result, which is probably a better idea. So of course, you need logic to do that forwarding. OK, let's, that's the second uh, fundamental way, which is detecting and forwarding, also called bypassing, data to the dependent instruction. Of course, in order to forward, you need to have a path from the end of the ALU to the register file stage. And you need to have a way of detecting that. Right? And that's not enough because the instructions may not be sequential right after each other. The dependent instruction may be after that. Right? There might be one instruction in between, which is, let's if you go back to this picture. Oh, there should be a nicer way of going back. OK, that's not that bad. So if you look at this instruction, this OR over here, this OR needs the result of this add again. And it's, we, again, we don't want to wait until the add writes to the register file because OR gets to the register file stage in cycle four. Well, how do you get the result? Well, add is in the memory stage and we know the result because we produce the result and we just carry, we're just carrying with it to write to the register file. So why don't we forward from this stage to this stage? So you need to have another forwarding path. And again, the, uh, the sub also is dependent, it turns out. It's a nice example. Uh, basically, at this point, add is writing to the register file, and sub is reading, to the reading from the register file. 
assuming this is true over here, write takes place in the first half and read takes place in the second half, then you don't need to do anything. There is no need for forwarding over here. Now, if this assumption was not true, you needed to do forwarding even over here. Okay, so I've given you the idea of forwarding, but we're going to go into more detail. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> I was going to ask that. Okay, so the second solution is detecting and forwarding data to dependent instruction. Of course, you need logic to do that. You need, uh, again, detecting is common here. The third is uh, detecting and eliminating at the software level. The software does the hard work. Because if our instructions are like that, as I shown you earlier, why doesn't the software actually detect this? They could at the compiler level. And reorder the instructions such that you don't need to forward or you don't need to wait. Well, how would the software do that? This is where this might be useful. And I wish we had prefetched and powered this off earlier. Oh, well, maybe I powered it on. Okay, let's see. I need something to write with. Okay. Now you're going to have to shout if this is not working well. Somebody said that zooming is a better, better idea, so we'll try that. Okay, so let's say uh, you have an add instruction that's writing into, I don't know, I, I like using R's. It, it sounds like a register, right? And the multiply instruction, that's a terrible multiply. Uh, R3, 5, I don't know, R5. And then another add using R5, R5, R6. And then dot, dot, dot. And then an add instruction over here, uh, that's basically, maybe we get rid of the dot, dot, dot. R2, R5, no, I don't like the R5, R10, R11. <laughs> okay, you can see this, right? So the compiler can easily do uh, analysis, it's called data dependence analysis, through the code, and basically detects this multiply is dependent on this add, and this Add is dependent on this multiply. And it can know that the machine is structured this way. You have a fetch stage. You have a decode stage, a register read stage. You have an ALU stage. You have a memory stage. And you have a write back stage. Uh, and when you fetch this add, uh, this add executes in the ALU stage. And its result is available. And assume that you don't have forwarding. This add needs to write back over here. So the next dependent instruction should come, how many? Three instructions after this add, right? The compiler can know that if it knows the structure of the machine, right? And how the machine operates. Basically, the assumption is that the data is written into the register file at the write-back stage, and the data can be read from the register file at the decode stage. So you need a distance of three instructions between dependent instructions. So the compiler can say, oh, I cannot put this multiply instruction over here because the machine otherwise would operate incorrectly because it's relying on me to detect the dependencies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find three independent instructions. Oh, there is one over here. And move it over here. Does that make sense? That way the compiler can ensure that the pipeline is full. Because now you're going to put independent instructions in between. What if the compiler cannot find an independent instruction? There is always an independent instruction. It's called a no-op. <laughs> Basically, the compiler fills three no-ops here if it cannot find any independent instruction, which is essentially a stall, basically, except it's a software-orchestrated stall. It's not a hardware-detected stall. Right? It's beautiful that you can do this at different levels. Of course... It's more powerful if the compiler can fill these slots with independent instructions. Let's say add, multiply, divide, I don't know. If they're independent of all of these over here, that's good. Now you keep the pipeline full. This is a software detection of data dependencies. And a lot of compiler work has gone into detecting and filling these holes, if you will, 
Uh, this is less of an issue if the hardware does more work, right? If the hardware actually is good at forwarding data, for example, the, the machine model could be there is a forwarding path from the ALU into the decode stage. So in that case, the compiler doesn't need to do anything, right? The compiler doesn't need, because there is no slot to fill, the compiler can put the multiply after the add, and there is no stall that needs to happen. But if the machine model requires some stalls in between dependent instructions, the compiler can improve performance by finding independent instructions and putting it inside there. Now, how does, it, how does the compiler find the independent instructions? First, it needs to do this data dependence analysis, right? And then do the movement of instructions. The problem is moving the instructions may lead to breaking the program semantics, right? Especially if you're trying to move instructions across control flow boundaries. That's always a danger, right? So if you have this con instruction in a branch, and you have two paths over here, and then you have something like this. If you move an instruction from here to here, what if the branch goes this way? Oh, so the compiler needs to be really careful. If you move an instruction from here to here and respect the data dependencies, well, maybe it's safe, right? It may be okay, as long as you reach this point. What if you don't reach this point? What if the machine gets interrupted before that? Or what if you get an exception, or you can be an inconsistent state. So there, there are rules for moving code, both upward and downward. And that has impact on not only performance, clearly it has an impact on performance by filling these slots, but also correctness of the program. So the compiler needs to be really careful uh, in doing this movement. And we're not going to cover this in class, but if you take a compiler's class, or if you take my advanced lecture, there's a lot of theory and practice in static code scheduling. So if you, for example, compile your code with minus O3 in GCC, you will get a lot of these code movements uh, to ensure that the uh, pipeline is flowing. Okay, so it's beautiful. Uh, this is beautiful because it doesn't need to do anything, which is the philosophy of MIPS, right? No need to uh, for the hardware to detect the dependence. Okay. So there are two other ways. These are maybe obvious, right? What are the two non-obvious ways? What else can you do? When you get a dependent instruction, anybody brave enough to? Insert some kind of barrier instruction that prevents the or like, I don't know. <laughs> So that's more like uh, basically inserting a no-op, basically, right? Yeah, you could potentially say, basically, the compiler can inform the hardware or there's a dependent instruction and you need to do something about it. That's, it's similar to no-op, I would say. Yes? I mean, if there's a branch instruction, you can predict uh, which branch you take and if you took the, the wrong one, you just flush. That's right, yes. So prediction, basically. You had the same idea? or Okay, excellent. So basically predict. Branch is a special case. But you can predict the needed value, right? It can be any value. Now it turns out branches, at least conditional branches, require a small prediction space. You need to predict whether it's taken or not taken. You need to choose from only two choices. And you need to know the target address. Usually it's easy to compute if you're taking the branch once. But doing it for arbitrary data values may be a little bit difficult, basically. Right? So you predict the needed value and execute speculatively and verify. This is an interesting choice. It's called value prediction. In the case of branch, it's, uh, branches, it's branch prediction or control flow prediction. But this is another possibility. What else? We're not going to cover this in more detail. Again, you can take the advanced course. In, 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 in some cases, this works really well, actually. Actually, let me, let me tie this in with, some, with something that we started early on. If you can afford to be approximate, and if you have a good value predictor, most of the time, you predict the value, and you keep the pipeline flowing. And if, you, if for some reason you get it wrong, it may be OK, right? Assuming your program can tolerate it again, right? That way, you get rid of all of these memory accesses going to memory. Right? OK, it's fun. It's fun, fun to be an architect, because you can play with a lot of these ideas. What is the last one? last one is my favorite, actually. Anybody who hasn't? Yes. Uh, 
Oh, well, now you're becoming very specific. Uh, that's good. That's a good idea with branches. Uh, that could be a good idea with branches. But in the general case of data dependency, it's very hard because you need to really compute multiple values, right? So if you have a register, for example, you can say, oh, I have 2 to the 32 values and do the 2 to the 32 computations. <laughs> that may not work. With branches, actually, we, will, we may get to cover that. With branches, that idea has been proposed. It's called multi-path execution. Uh, that's right, yes. <laughs> but, but that's a special case with branches. So anybody who wants to guess before the break? Yes. I see. So you, you basically want to execute some other instructions that whose values are available. I see. That's basically the concept of auto order execution. Yes, and we will uh, we will talk about that. But I wasn't thinking of that. That's a good one. Maybe I should maybe I should add that. That's right because it's really detecting and doing something else in a different level. But what I had in mind, I will tell you after the break. <laughs> so you may think about it a little bit. <laughs> now you can discuss. It's a good break discussion for you. <laughs> All right, let's continue. No way this doesn't. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, have, have you thought about the fifth solution? Actually, I, li I like the last proposal, which is really uh, along the lines of find something independent to execute, right? Don't wait for the dependence to resolve, but find something independent. That's the core of out of order execution. But that requires finding something independent to execute. That actually requires detecting the dependence still. Basically detect the dependence and find something else to do. We will see that it requires moving the dependent instructions somewhere else where they wait and keeping the independent instructions executing, and then merging the results together in a sequential execution order. That's the core idea of out order execution. Detect the dependence, move the independent instructions somewhere else, move the dependent instructions somewhere else until their values become available. Keep executing the independent ones. When the values become available, wake up the dependent instructions and execute them and then finish them in the order specified by the programmer. That's in, in a nutshell out of order execution for you. That's a way of handling dependencies again. But the last one over here, which the slide should be updated with that, I think, detect and do something uh, else. But it's too complicated to explain in one slide, clearly. Uh, nothing on the last one? This is also about doing something else without detecting it. Basically, it's eliminating the data dependence problem. And I like always those solutions that are different. And these sol this solution is actually employed in today's GPUs. GPU cores are very simple uh, because of this. They don't need to detect dependencies. Basically, they do something else. You fetch an instruction. The next instruction is completely unrelated to this instruction, which means that it belongs to a different thread of execution, belongs to a different program. The next instruction is also completely independent. So all of the instructions in different pipeline stages are from different programs. If you do that, there's no relationship between the instructions, no dependencies, and as a result, your hardware is really simple. This is the idea of fine-grained multi-threading. And we'll talk about that first, because it's important. It's different. So basically, uh, the idea is to have the hardware have multiple thread contexts, multiple different program counters, and multiple different register files, 
Each cycle, the fetch engine fetches from a different thread. And by the time the fetched branch or instruction resolves or finishes, no instruction is fetched from the th same thread. That way you've eliminated the need for detecting the dependency, waiting for the dependency, or doing anything about the dependency. You can keep the pipeline beautiful, simple, and just make sure you have enough threads to execute. So basically, the instruction resolution latency is overlap with execution of other threads' instructions. This is a me mechanism for latency tolerance. So the upside is big. There's no logic for handling control our data dependencies within a thread because there's no, there are no two instructions present from the same thread in the pipeline at the same time. The problem is, of course, single thread performance suffers. If you care about that really important thread, you're fetching an instruction from that thread every n cycles. If you have a deep pipeline, n could be, I don't know, 30 cycles. Right? Modern GPUs have about, I don't know, six stages, maybe every six cycles from the same thread. Of course, this is, another, this is a very good mechanism for handling really long latency operations, right? If you have a really long latency operation, a load from a thread, don't fetch from that thread for 1,000 cycles. Just do something else. Other threads keep progressing. As, as long as you have a lot of threads, this is great. That's the idea. And GPUs, traditionally coming from the graphics space, where you have millions of pixels, each of which is operated by a separate thread, they have this luxury. Right? They have lots of threads. OK, so there are other downsides. Extra logic for keeping thread contexts. This could actually go up significantly because you need to have a program counter and a register file, basically the architectural context of each thread present in the hardware. Remember, in a single threaded machine so far, we had a single program counter, a single register file. And of course, this requires uh, you need a lot. Uh, you need to have uh, you, uh, this requires you to have a lot of threads. I mean, this don't, don't underestimate. There are a lot of negatives over here, but the positive is a big positive also. If you have a lot of threads, this is a good solution. Uh, okay, basically, I mean, I've given you this idea. Switch to another thread every cycle, such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently. This tolerates all sorts of dependencies with useful work from other threads and improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. And it's a really old idea. It's become really popular recently with the GPUs, but the old idea uh, is present in Control Data 6600, which is really the first out-of-order execution machine that did this in a part of its system, which I will briefly talk about, and later other multi-threaded computers uh, designed by Burton Smith uh, especially had this characteristic. But I'll give you a brief history, very brief history. Uh, basically, people have realized that uh, memory pipeline is a problem uh, in the CDC, Control Data 6600. This is actually a, a, a machine that was designed uh, by this uh, little company that was competing with big IBM at the time. And the, 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 comp uh, the control data machine was much faster than IBM's uh, early processors, the 360 design, which was not out of order. Uh, later, IBM actually decided to make their machines out of order to actually beat this company. They had a hard time beating it, but they did eventually. Uh, but basically, this, uh, they, the, the designers of this machine, uh, Thornton, Jim Thornton in particular, figured out that the memory latency is 10 cycles. And uh, if you want to tolerate this memory latency, you can have a pipeline that's 10 deep, and you can basically generate a memory operation every cycle from different threads. Basically, this was the first uh, use of this uh, uh, concept of multi-threading, fine-grained multi-threading. And a GPU essentially does this also today. I'll show you. Uh, this is another machine that was one of the earlier ones. Basically, they had 120 threads per processor. I'll give, uh, basically, they had a waiting queue for threads and an available queue, so instructions uh, the threads that were waiting for a data element from memory were put into this waiting queue, and you would keep fetching from one other thread that's available every cycle. But you would never fetch from the same thread until you finished the execution of the previous instruction of that thread. Okay, I've just said that. Basically, to each thread, if you think about this, to each thread, a processor looks like a non-pipeline machine, right? You have one instruction flowing through the pipeline, but you cannot inject another instruction from that thread until that instruction finishes. So there's a, a clear trade-off between system throughput. You can process many, many threads, 
but single thread performance suffers. Right? So if you have this really important thread that, you need to, that needs to respond to you, very critical transaction, for example, too bad, right? This machine doesn't work very well. So this was uh, the picture of this heterogeneous element processor. Basically, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. You have this queue of threads, uh, available threads, and you would supply one thread uh, to fetch the instruction, and then that thread would fetch its operands for that instruction, and then perform a function, or go into a queue to wait for memory. And then after uh, the, the, the thread, the instruction finishes, it would go back to the queue to be fetched. Right? This is a little bit different, right? You basically uh, decide what to fetch from after the instruction finishes from that thread. Right? Or the thread's ID gets stuck in this queue if you're waiting for memory from some other machine or from the same, uh, same machine, right? If you're waiting for, if, if this instruction is, requires data from, from uh, off-chip, uh, it could be any place, right? It could be some other processor. So you don't fetch from that instruction until, uh, you don't fetch from that thread until the instruction comes back all the way to the fetch queue. It's kind of a beautiful, a very different design, right? And this, in, internally, this could be pipeline, basically. Internally, this fetch stage, uh, all of these stages could be pipeline, and there could be multiple functions. So if you look at the cycle time, at, at that time was 100 nanoseconds. You had eight stages, which means that you needed 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction, assuming no memory access, but no control and data dependency checking. And this is Burton Smith. Uh, OK, so this is the cost of it. Basically, you have multiple program counters. You have multiple register files. So your cost increases with the number of threads that you need to support linearly. Uh, there were other processors that were designed. So you can see that you have a thread select engine that decides which PC to uh, select from. Of course, it may not be as simple as this, but this is a conceptual example. Uh, this is Sun Niagara. It's one of the first uh, multi-core processors. Their, their goal was to keep the hardware simple. Every core is very simple, but you have eight cores. So what's interesting here? Let's look at this. This is the fetch logic over here. Basically, they have four threads. They had six stages. So you can actually have multiple instructions from the same thread in different parts. But the later stages don't require dependence checking, basically. That's how they ensured that uh, you, they, you, they didn't need dependence checking logic. Because some of the later stages, you don't need to check the dependence after that point. Right? OK, uh, so here, uh, basically, you can fetch from four different threads, and there are reasons for which thread to select from. It could be instruction type. It could be whether or not the thread has a miss. It could be whether or not there's a resource conflict that you should not fetch from this thread because there is waiting for a resource. It could be it's interrupted. Basically, this logic decides which program counter, which thread to fetch from. And then there's also another logic that selects which thread uh, to decode from. And then there are four register files over here. And then uh, there's four store buffers. So you, you, they, they keep the store instructions separate. So we, we're not going to deal with this probably in this class. But once we get to the uh, bigger uh, or more advanced class, you will see that there are store buffer buffers in modern machines. You don't do a store directly into memory because stores actually can take a long time. But you, you have the data av available. You put it into a buffer and let the memory system deal with it. You can get the value of the store from the store buffer if a load later needs it. That's the beauty of the store buffer. But now you decoupled the processor from the memory system. The memory system will handle the store and ensure that it finishes. But the processor can continue executing instructions without waiting for that store to complete into memory. There's no reason for the store, for a processor to wait a thousand cycles for a store to be done into memory because it already has a value available. That's another uh, way of reducing the latency, basically. Of course, you cannot do it with a load, right? <laughs> because you need the data for the load. But uh, because you don't have the data, that's why you're doing the load. But for stores, you have these store buffers. There are also load buffers, but we'll get into that without order execution. Maybe. OK, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of fine-grained multi-threading in, in a little bit more detail? Basically, we've already said that there's no need for dependency checking between instructions. Uh, there's no need for branch prediction logic. We will see branch prediction. We've discussed this briefly. Some of you talked about it. Basically, otherwise, bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. As a result, you hopefully get improved system throughput, lots of threads per cycle, latency tolerance. You tolerate the long latency operations, 
Because if one thread is waiting for memory, maybe there are a thousand threads that are not need waiting for memory. And better utilization of the hardware resources. Dis disadvantages, we've discussed this extra hardware complexity. Reduced single thread performance. This is one of the reasons why this is not employed uh, by Intel processor, for example. But there's some sort of multi-threading employed by a lot of Intel processors to tolerate latencies to get some of the benefits, but not all. Uh, and this also causes resource contention between threads in the caches and memory. Now you have multiple threads contending for resources. Right? This is actually important, and we will probably get to it, uh, the discussion of this. Uh, of course, you can say, oh, mm, these threads may not be completely independent. Right? Or how do you guarantee their complete independence? If they're working on the same problem, they need to coordinate. And you may still need some dependency checking between threads if those threads are present together. For example, one thread may do a load from a location another thread stores into if they're basically synchronizing on shared data or shared lock variables, right? So there, this sort of dependency ch checking logic is very difficult to eliminate in a shared memory machine. And if you take an advanced architecture course, we get into a lot of detail on how to do parallel architectures and parallel, uh, not necessarily programming, but how to actually bridge the gap between the parallel programming and the hardware architecture. So if I tell you that you eliminate all dependency ch checking logic, that's wrong if you have communication between threads. Normally, threads communicate through the shared memory if you have a shared memory model, not registers. So you can eliminate the register dependency checking, but memory dependency checking is more difficult. OK, so modern GPUs are actually fine-grained multi-threaded machines. Uh, I'll give you a very quick overview. Uh, maybe you won't see this. This is actually a really old GPU now, NVIDIA GTX 20, 285. Hopefully, you're not using it. <laughs> uh, other than exper for experimental purposes. But basically, this picture shows that you can decode instruction streams, and you have a bunch of eight data parallel, or SIMD, single instruction, multiple data functional units, and you share the control across these eight units. Basically, you can do uh, multiple, uh, a single instruction, and you can do the same instruction on multiple data elements over here. And you have eight of them over here. And in this machine, you could do multiply and add and multiply, for example. And there's execution context storage, basically registers for many, many threads. So why are these uh, data parallel machines? Basically, uh, you can have, so GPUs, we'll, we'll get to this hopefully, but uh, what uh, the GPUs, the way they operate is that you can group 32 threads together and they share the exact same instruction stream. They execute the same program, basically, 32 threads, except they operate on different elements, data elements. So if you can think about a, 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 an array divided into 32, all of these 32 threads do the same thing on different portions of the array. One thirty second, one thirty thirty second of the array, basically. This is called a warp, basically. These 32 threads that are doing exactly the same thing, that are at the same program counter, except they're operating on different data elements, are called a warp. And we'll see why they're called a warp, uh, but that's OK. Uh, they execute the same instruction on different data. Now, GPUs have the parallelism, so basically think of this as 8 or 32. 32 of them you can execute at the same time. Now, what do you fetch next? Another warp, another set of 32 threads. What do you fetch next? Another set of 32 threads. Basically, you can interleave 32 warps in a fine-grained multi-threaded manner where each warp has 32 threads. Does that make sense? So you fetch this warp of 32 threads, when that moves to decode stage, you fetch the next warp of 32 threads. When the pipeline moves, you fetch the next warp of 32 threads. When the pipeline moves, we fetch the next warp of 32 threads. So if your pipeline is six deep, you have six times 32 threads in the machine. Because each warp has 32 threads, right? And you have, if one of them needs to access memory and memory access takes 500 cycles, what a modern GPU does is very similar to the hydrogenous element processor that I just described. It takes off that warp, puts it to the side, into the waiting queue. It waits. Other warps that don't need the memory keep executing. This warp waits, let's say, 1,000 cycles. And when the data comes back, this warp goes back to the available queue to be fetched. So this machine is very, very similar to 
really this machine, except it's operating on the granularity of warps, not a single thread. But that's a very simple semantic gap that you need to finish. Instead of op executing a single thread, you have many threads doing exactly the same thing in the same program counter, except on different data elements. OK. So that's a GPU, basically. And you can see that you can store up to 1,024 thread context, 32 times 32. And uh, I believe, according to Mohammed, uh, modern GPUs have 64 uh, warps that can be interleaved in a fine-grained multi-threaded manner. Where are you? OK, is that correct? So you have 64. What about a warp? What's the size of that? It's 32 still? OK, so they've kept it as 32, but they've increased the number of things that can be interleaved because probably of, because of the memory latency to tolerate. OK, well, if you look at a, not a modern, but the GTX 285, it actually looks like this. <laughs> you basically have 30 of these cores, each of which has 1,024 threads. So you really have 30,720 threads. And a lot of it is dedicated to this execution context storage, which is basically the registers, register files. And that consumes a lot of space and energy in a GPU. OK, that's the end of fine-grained multi-threading. Well, let's take a look at some other ways of handling data dependencies. Uh, so detection. Uh, fine-grained multi-threading is beautiful because it doesn't require you to detect. But if you want to improve single-thread performance, you've got to do the hard work. And the hard work requires detection. Uh, it's also called interlocking. Basically, it's the detection of dependence between instructions in a pipeline processor to guarantee correct execution and also enable high-performance execution. So we've just discussed software-based interlocking with this code example. Software detects, and hardware can be really simple. Of course, there are downsides and upsides. We can discuss that, or you can think about that, but we don't have enough time to cover all of those. But we'll talk about hardware-based interlocking. How do you detect? Uh, actually, before that, I guess MIPS acronym. This is essentially MIPS. MIPS was initially designed for software doing the hard work. Multi uh, uh, microprocessor without interlocking pipeline stages. Software does the interlocking. Hardware doesn't do anything. Of course, if you look at the latest MIPS processors, they all do hardware-based interlocking. <laughs> because for high performance, it's very hard to do it just at the compiler level. You need to do it cooperatively. OK, so how do you detect the dependencies? We'll go through this relatively quickly. You can think of many ways. But one way that's been used is scoreboarding. Conceptually, it's very nice. Basically, each register. In the register file has a valid bit associated with it. An instruction that's writing to the register resets the valid bit when you decode it. In the decode state, you reset the valid bit. An instruction in the decode state checks if all its source and destination registers are valid. If it's true, it can progress. It doesn't need to stall. If it's false, you need to stall the instruction. Now, you can optimize this. You can ask, why, are the des why do we check the destination? Well, you, don't, you need to ensure that write after write dependencies are also obeyed, right? <laughs> Uh, the advantage is very simple. It's basically one bit per register. The disadvantage is now you need to stall for all types of dependencies, not only flow dependencies, right? Now I can think of how do, how do you actually fix this? Uh, well, maybe you don't check the destination register if it's valid, but you ensure that destination register is written at the end, right? But then a single valid bit may not work. What if you have multiple instructions writing to the same destination register that are further into pipeline? Right? You need to have a counter then, right? Because multiple instructions may be writing to the same register. So you cannot just reset the valid bit when one instruction writes. You need to decrement the counter. You need to ensure the latest value gets into the register file. So if you design a pipeline processor, you will figure this out. OK, basically, I've just given you the answer to that question. What changes would you make to the scoreboard to enable not stalling on anti-output dependencies? Was that clear? Maybe you can think about it. Uh, on your own a little bit. But basically, if you have a, simple a single valid bit, it, it, it uh, prevents the progress of all instructions, uh, all dependencies. OK, so there are other approaches, which is combinational dependence check logic. You add special logic that checks if any instruction at a later stage in the pipeline is supposed to write to any source register of the instruction that's being decoded. If the answer is yes, you stall the instruction in the pipeline. Right? Basically, you have these later pipeline stages. Actually, this is probably better to, uh, OK, I'm not sure if I, it's too complicated. Uh, 
I'll just draw it quickly. I'm going to give you examples of that. You have this fetch stage, you have this decode stage, uh, ALU stage, memory stage, and write back stage. And you can hopefully see. So basically, an instruction needs to wait for its operands here. Uh, an instruction, well, I'll just put the pipeline registers, why not? My ugly pipeline registers. So an instruction may be writing to register X over here, write to register X. Another instruction may be writing to register. I don't know why. Another instruction may be writing to register Z. In order to stall this instruction, well, let's ignore the write back part because write back actually can, uh, we're, we're going to assume that the register file, you can write to the register file and read from the register file in health cycles. Let's ignore that for now. Basically, this, to, in order to stall this instruction, you need to check if the source register A and source register B somehow equals any of these registers, right? Basically, that's a combinational dependence check logic. And I'll just show you how to build that logic. Is this equal to this? Or this? OK. Color is good. Ah. And is this equal to this? Or this? And if any of these evaluate to true, you have an OR gate, an ugly OR gate, you basically generate a stall signal. Right? You stall this instruction. If any later instruction is writing to any source register, that's the idea. And you can see the complexity of this now. If you have more pipeline stages, you need to check all of them. right? So this combinational logic can become your critical path easily. Because you need to see which instructions are writing to, if, if any of the later instructions are writing to any of the source registers over here. Okay, but there's actually more complicated things are done, so it's doable. <laughs> so upside is no need to stall on anti and output dependencies because you just check for flow dependencies. There is no reason to check for anti and output dependencies. Those are easy to handle as we discussed, right? You write to the destination register at the very end. The disadvantage is logic is more complex. And logic even becomes more complex as you make the pipeline deeper and wider. Well, what is wider? Wider. So deeper means you add more pipeline stages. Well, assume that you have 30 stages over here to increase your clock frequency. That may or may not be a good idea, but if you have that, now you need to do this logic increase in complexity. Now you can also go wider, meaning you have another fetch engine over here fetching from, uh, you basically do parallel fetch. Uh, from sequential instructions, right? You fetch instruction number one, two, three, four, five, and then you basically fetch five instructions per cycle. Now, if you do that, you need to check dependencies between these instructions also, right? Not only, not only uh, uh, in the horizontal dimension, you need to check dependencies in the vertical dimension. Assume that this is the oldest instruction that you're fetching, and this is the youngest in the same cycle. You need to ensure that the youngest instruction obeys the dependencies, right? So it becomes a very complicated dependency check logic as you increase the pipeline depth no, as well as the pipeline width. So if your pipeline depth is 20 and your pipeline depth is 6, which is not unreasonable today, you have 120 different combinations of dependency check. Of course, you can eliminate them some because not all of the... Uh, at the end of the pipeline, you may not, not need to check the dependencies as we just show, as we've just seen over here with the right back stage. But it becomes complex. And this is also done in superscalar out of order processors today. OK, so this is called superscalar execution, making, uh, making such that you can fetch multiple instructions per cycle. It's called superscalar execution. So it's not scalar, not a single value. It's superscalar, it's multiple different instructions from the same thread. OK, once you detect the dependence in hardware, what do you do afterwards, right? Uh, uh, we've covered some of these, but we'll go into a little bit more detail right now. Basically, dependence between two instructions is detected before the communicated data value becomes available. Right? The option one, the uh, slow, slower option, stole the dependent instruction right away. As we discussed, it's a bad idea. Option two, stole the dependent instruction only when it's really necessary. 
basically forward the data from the appropriate stage. And there could be other options. So what is data forwarding bypassing? A consumer instruction has to wait in the decode stage until the producer instruction writes its value into the register file. That's the problem we're solving. We don't want to stall the pipeline unnecessarily. So the observation here is that the data value needed by the consumer instruction can be supplied directly from a later stage in the pipeline instead of only from the register file. Basically, supply the data value when it's produced. And this should remind, uh, basically, the idea is to add additional dependence check logic and data forwarding paths to supply the producer's value to the consumer right after the value is available. The benefits, the consumer can move in the pipeline until the point the value can be supplied. Less stalling. So you don't need to wait until the, until the value is written into the register file. Uh, so this is actually very aligned with the data flow principles. We're, we're going to see another slide, right? Basically, data flow says the data should be supplied when it's ready. In that case, you fetch the instruction. In this case, we're still in a von Neumann machine. Basically, when you supply the data, flow, data directly uh, when it's produced, it's the closest uh, amount of delay that you induce on the instruction that's dependent. Right? So data forwarding is a very limited application of data flow into the von Neumann model. Very limited. OK, a special case of data dependency is control dependence, as you, some of you have uh, talked about. This is basically can be thought about data dependence on the instruction pointer, program counter. It's essentially a, another register, right? And control, the, the question here is a little bit different because that determines what you fetch. So what should the fetch PC, fetch program counter, be in the next cycle? Ad answer is address of the next instruction. The question is, what is the next instruction? All instructions are actually pre dependent on the previous ones in a sequential machine, right? Because you need the program counter value to be calculated to be able to fetch the instruction, next instruction. Now, in most cases, when you're executing sequential, this is trivial. You actually know what instruction that is. It's PC plus 4 in MIPS, right? Uh, the, the instruction at address PC plus 4. So the problem happens if the fetch instructions, uh, well, if the fetch instruction is a non-control flow instruction, next fetch PC is the address of the next sequential instruction, which is good, which can be easily computed. So assuming that you always go to the next sequential instruction is one form of predicting the control flow, right? Saying that, oh, next instruction is likely the next sequential instruction, so I'm going to increment the PC and fetch from it. The problem happens, uh, well, the problem happens if the instruction that's fetched is a control flow instruction. How do you determine the next fetch, fetch PC? Well, how do you even know that it's a control flow instruction? You haven't even decoded it yet. Right? You're fetching. Whereas decode comes later in the pipeline, right? So this problem has fascinated many people and many people have worked on predicting what should be the next instruction to fetch. And modern processors have very, very sophisticated branch prediction engines that use many different components to be accurate. And in many cases, they're as accurate as 97, 98%. So 98% of the branches are predicted correctly. But there are some programs where the prediction accuracy is much lower, of course, especially the branches that are dependent on incoming data is very difficult to predict. So this could be, if we, if we had more time in this class, we would cover branch prediction, but we're going to cover really the basics, the much more advanced branch prediction methods we're going to leave for the advanced architecture course. But people have made a lot of money from Intel to actually <laughs> make this work. Let me, let me put it that way. It's a hard problem. It's, it's one of the hardest problems in computer architecture in a control flow machine. OK, well, there's another thing that I skipped over here, but I think uh, this is also important. This actually makes life a little bit more complicated, because if you know the size of the fetch instruction, that's good. But if you have a pipeline machine, and if you don't know the instruction size, if you have a variable length ISA, if your instruction set architecture doesn't have fixed size, fixed length instructions, you have a problem. You don't need to, you, even the next sequential instruction, you don't know because you don't know the address, because you don't know the, what, uh, what the length of the currently fetched instruction is, right? because you haven't decoded it yet. Only after you decode it do you know the size of the instruction. Right? x86 is a variable length ISA. An instruction can be 1 byte or 17 bytes, depending on a lot of things that happen during decode. You figure it out during decode, basically. So next instruction to fetch. The address, even the address you cannot determine, even if it's sequential. Right? How do you do that? Well, that's 
That's the beauty of designing <laughs> a machine with a complex ISA like that. OK, let's go into a little bit more detail. So we've, we know this right now. Uh, flow dependence, anti-dependence, output dependence. You, you should know this very well. I think this is a figure that we've seen earlier. Basically, it's very similar to what I've shown uh, before, except they were not ads. But basically, this ad produces a value, RA, register A, and all of the instructions are dependent on it. I and mean, we don't care what other registers are. So for this pipeline to work correctly, this is, this is where the name hazard comes from, actually. This is hazardous, right? You need to ensure that this instruction doesn't get this value over here until this instruction writes back. Uh, so, but this instruction is safe, assuming you can write to the register file in the health cycle and read from the register file in the next cycle. So how do you resolve the data dependence? Basically, this, you can insert bubbles, right? But we don't want that, as you know, right? So what is a stall? To define a stall more formally, actually, you can, uh, I'm not going to be formal in this course, but you can define a lot of these things very, very formally in terms of whether the pipeline should move based on this distance between instructions uh, and how do you make sure this is correct. And people have dealt with formal, formalism in the 1970s. I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to give you the insights. Uh, but you can define all of these very, very formally and prove uh, characteristics of whether or not a pipeline is correctly moving, executing instructions. It's much more difficult to prove the performance. So we're going to uh, talk more about the performance aspects because it's very difficult to do that formally, at least right now. But basically, stall means make the dependent instruction wait until its source data value is available. In the hardware implementation, you need to stall all upstream stages and drain all downstream stages. Upstream, uh, upstream meaning the younger instructions that are being fetched. Downstream means older instructions that you need to get out of the pipeline. Basically, you need to drain the pipeline and stall the upstream. We'll see that. Basically, this is one of the machines that we've looked at. How do you implement stalling? Uh, if, you dis if you discover that this instruction is dependent on some other instruction later on, and you don't have the value in the register file, or you cannot bypass the value, you disable the program counter. You don't write to it. And you disable this instruction register such that this instruction stays over here. You don't write to it. And you keep the other instructions moving. But you should ensure that the instruction, this instruction cannot move now. It needs to wait. But what do you inject over here? Well, you inject a no-op. Right? This is basically a hardware-injected no-op, as opposed to a software-injected no-op that we've seen earlier. How do you inject the no-op in hardware? Make sure this, uh, this pipeline register is invalid. Right? This is called a bubble again. How do you do it invalid? You can have a valid bit associated with it, and you can set it to zero. You can clear the control signals such that they reflect a no-op. That's another way of doing it. But there are multiple ways of doing it. I like the valid bits because that, when you inspect the pipeline, you can easily see, oh, this pipeline register is not valid, meaning that it's, it's carrying something that's garbage. It's not going to have any effect. So from a testability and design perspective, it's more principled to have a valid bit, in my opinion, because now when you actually are trying to debug this pipeline, you can check that valid bit. It's a lot harder to inspect the, all of the contents of the control signals to conclude this is a no-op. Again, you may save a bit, but saving a bit doesn't always save you time later on. So if you think about design for testing this machine, it's always better to have the valid bit over there. <laughs> OK, so this is uh, the data depends example that we've seen before, or at least something similar to it. I hope you can see this over here. But basically, uh, this is the wrong thing. Uh, this add writes, to, writes into S0 in the first cycle of cycle five, and this end reads S0 on cycle three, or reads S0 on cycle four, subreads S0 in the second half of cycle five. So this is correct, but these guys are not correct. So clearly, uh, this is a wrong pipeline. That's why this is a hazard. But we don't want hazards. This is the example of compile time detection and elimination. If you want to eliminate this potential hazard, if you will, the compiler inserts two no ops, and life is beautiful again. <laughs> Except you wasted two of your slots. You reduced your cycle, you, you've increased your cycles per instruction overall, right? So no ops are bad. You actually increase your instruction count also. <laughs> so you know the uh, equation, right? The performance equation. This is fun. <laughs> We can find the performance equation. 
You can probably recite that if I ask you in an exam. Uh, so execution time. Can you guys see it? Oh, we need a light, I think. Okay, that's better. Equals with my terrible writing. Number of instructions times uh, cycles per instruction times clock cycle time, right? So if you inject no ops, you're increasing the number of instructions and you're reducing, you're increasing the CPI, right? Well, this, I'm not sure. I mean, you're definitely increasing the number of instructions. You can think of it that way. So basically, you're increasing the execution time, right? <laughs> so this is a bad idea in general. <laughs> Of course, you can think about uh, how to compare. So as, uh, this, this works, this execution time equation, and my point is this execution time equation works if the, num if the work is the same. Here, you're really increasing the number of instructions with a no-op. So uh, one way of uh, reducing the execution time is by eliminating no-ops, for example, right? So if you have a bad compiler, you can always improve its performance by eliminating the no-ops. But that doesn't mean that you're starting with a good baseline. So whenever you see a lot of no-ops, it's probably a bad baseline. <laughs> That's my point over here. So be very careful. So OK, inserting enough no-ops for the required result to be ready is the idea of software-based interlocking. Basically, or as we discussed earlier, if you can move the independent usable instructions up, it turns out that's a difficult task. And we're not going to cover that. So data forwarding, data bypassing, we've already covered this briefly, but I'm going to give you the uh, mechanics of it. Uh, and the basic idea we've seen in data flow, forward the result to the uh, value to the data dependent instruction as soon as the value is available. Basically, in data flow, data value supplied to the dependent instruction as soon as it's available. Right? Instruction executes when all of its operands are available. So data forwarding brings a pipeline closer to data flow execution principles, but just by this much, perhaps. So this is the concept of data forwarding. Illustrate a little bit more. Uh, if you look at this, now the data value is available here. You can bypass it. You can latch the data value and bypass it directly into the input of the ALU. right? Or you can bypass it directly into the other input of the ALU. That's the idea. So in order to be able to do that, you need to have additional dependence check and detection logic and additional muxes also. Now the input of the ALU doesn't come only from the previous stage where you read the register file, but it could also come from the latched value of the output of the ALU, a previous add, or it could also come from the latched value over here, right? Uh, if you look over here, uh, yeah, basically you need to forward from these two different paths into the input of the ALU. And also, both inputs of the ALU. And you need to have this dependence check logic that we've drawn over here, uh, the little monster of comparators that basically check for dependence, whether you should forward, which value you should forward, and whether you should forward. So this part of the machine becomes more complicated, as you can see. OK, I think we've discussed this, basically. You forward to the execute stage from either the memory stage or the write back stage. When should you do that? I think we've already discussed this. If that stage will write a destination register and the destination register matches the source register that you're trying to read from. And if both of them contain matching destination registers, then memory stage should have the priority because it contains the younger instruction, right? You should always forward from the youngest instruction because this youngest instruction overwrites the value that's written by this one. Now, it's a concocted example over here because this may write to the register 5 and this also writes to register 5 then this value is kind of dead, right? You've overwritten register 5. OK, so you can study this on your own, but it's conceptually pretty simple. So stalling, as we've discussed, so let's assume that we have data forwarding. Can we eliminate all of the data dependencies that way by forwarding? Unfortunately not. Uh, basically, forwarding is not always sufficient. Because there are cases when forwarding is not possible due to pipeline design and instruction latencies, even in this really, really simple pipeline. So that trouble over there indicates that you're executing a load instruction. The load instruction has its value produced right at this point, right? Now this AND instruction needs that value right away, right? 
Now, you could potentially do, for, do this forwarding, right? But there's a downside to that. If you actually forward the data from the output of memory input of the ALU directly, what did you do? Any thoughts? Yes? Exactly. Yeah, you increase your clock cycle time. There's a reason why this is just memory. There's a why, reason why this is just ALU. If you forward the data value produced from memory to ALU in the same clock cycle, your clock cycle has become like the sum of both of those operations now. So you could do that forwarding, yes. In this case, it's not really forwarding but it's because you're essentially lengthening the pipeline stage. So that's a bad idea. So without lengthening the pipeline stage, there is no way you can forward the data value because the data value is over here. But by that time, the end instruction would have executed. So here, there's no way to supply the value uh, with data forwarding. Because, the, uh, yeah, this is written over here. So oh, here, what you need to do over here is stalling. And in order to implement stalling, you need to detect that data dependence and wait. Okay, we're going to pick up from here and continue tomorrow.